thank all of you for coming out here, especially on a weekday evening. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to uh, introduce my uh, co-author, Elizabeth Ames. Why don't you stand up, Elizabeth? <clears throat> she was uh, extremely helpful in uh, researching and helping write the book. As Larry indicated, uh, this book is really very timely right now, especially after what happened in Massachusetts. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe capitalism, perhaps capitalism isn't quite such a dirty word as it was a few days ago. But the book was written in an easygoing conversational style, in a Q&A style, to really explain the essence of the system of American capitalism. What it is, what it isn't, answer questions about it, and address the hostility and distrust that the whole idea of capitalism still seems to engender. There is a fundamental misunderstanding out in the world today, including the United States and particularly in Washington and in many state capitals as well, about what is really capitalism. A lot of uh, myths have risen about it, that it's based on greed, that it uh, does bad things, that it brings out the worst in people. But as we try to explain in this book, it does exactly the opposite, that free markets do have a moral basis. Unfortunately, even people who are sympathetic in general to free market economics have many misunderstandings about it. And particularly, the paradox noted by Joseph Schumpeter, the great Austrian economist, is that many of those who've benefited from the system turn on the system. They feel ashamed of the system. So in essence, many of us are like fish in water. Fish don't know they're swimming in water. We don't know what real free markets are about. And so because of that, we do things that end up undermining free markets. So people don't learn about free markets in colleges and universities, where they still seem enamored of Marx and Keynes. Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, the British economist, making a big comeback. People, most in the media, certainly don't get it. So there is sort of this mistrust and hostility, a vague feeling that this isn't quite a moral system. So that's why we did it in a conversational style, as if you were sitting around a table, having a discussion with your kids, your aunt or uncle or friends or whatever, and discuss what it is and what it isn't, and deal with what we call the raps on capitalism. It also is a nonpartisan book. Uh, fortunate, unfortunately, there is no virtue when it comes to political parties. We point out that John Kennedy, Democrat, for example, got it right on the dollar, which he said should be as good as gold, got it right on taxes and trade. Uh, Ronald Reagan, Republican, certainly got it right on taxes and trade and uh, inflation. Bill Clinton got it right on trade and the importance of a stable dollar, or at least a strong dollar. And another Republican, sadly, George W. Bush, did not get it right on the dollar, which has uh, led to some of the, prob the basic problems we face today. The book draws on free market advocates from Adam Smith to Thomas Sowell to many here at the Manhattan Institute. So in that sense, in that sense, it is an assemblage of living voices, and Adam Smith is still a living voice today. Uh, when you read him and the, what, what he, uh, his insights into the moral basis of capitalism, and the essence of capitalism, and this is something to keep in mind when you see those Hollywood cliches of these evil, fat, they're always fat, uh, <laughs> bloated, greedy business types, you know, uh, or, or sinister looking, you know, it, it, it's always, always, always a sinister looking uh, villain, is that you succeed in true free markets only by meeting the needs and wants of other people. You can think of yourself as greedy, as lusting for money, but you're not going to get the money unless you provide something that somebody else wants. It takes two to make a transaction. Adam Smith talks about the butcher providing the dinner. Think of it today. You go to a restaurant. You want the food. Restaurant would like your money. Restaurant gives you the food. You give them the money. You both get something out of it. So you can have that kind of personality so beloved by novelists in Hollywood, of a bad personality, the kind that makes babies cry and dogs bark when you walk down the street. You know, go to your hands, yes. But in a true free market, you're not going to make it unless you serve the needs and wants of other people. And because the system is open in a free market, because it's voluntary, nobody makes you do things, 
it creates these enormous arrays and webs of cooperation and collaboration. And it works because no one is in charge. It happens spontaneously, meeting the needs and wants of others. You think of the restaurant. Restaurant assumes the farmer grows the food, that the food is delivered to the food processor, that the trucker will deliver the food, the truck will be made, the truck will have the fuel, the highway will be there, the restaurant will have the equipment to cook the food and the people to serve the, all of the, it's amazing, all the things that go on that we just take for granted. So that is why it underscores and strengthens morality, democracy, the basis of a free society. Only free people can make these things happen. And it brings out an essence, even though we read about all the bad people, and bad people exist everywhere, not just in capitalism, but human nature has not changed for 4,000 years, before even that. But it is a system, though, that if you want to succeed in it, it forces you to cooperate with other people without you even knowing it. It forces you to figure out what does another person want. It encourages you to be creative and innovative. And it doesn't guarantee success. As you know, most new businesses fail within five years of inception. But because it allows for creativity, people are out there striving to do it. And when somebody comes up with something that you want, that person comes out ahead and is rewarded, rightly so. You come out ahead, getting something you probably didn't even know you needed. We talk about the iPod economy. You know, think of it, 10 years ago, if you said the word iPod, people would wonder, is, is that some remake of a movie of aliens, pod people coming, or what, iPod? Now, now it's something that uh, hundreds of millions of people can't exist. We almost look like aliens now, with our wires coming out of our ears and everything, uh, w w walking around. So that's the essence of the system. Bad people, yes. Every, every system's gonna have bad people. But capitalism, look at the essence, has been the most successful system ever in enabling people to discover their talents, develop their talents, expand their talents, as Abraham Lincoln put it, to improve one's lot in life. So where's the, where's the role of government? Sadly, James Madison, father of our Constitution, was exactly right when he observed that we are not angels, and because of that, we need government. But government's role in free markets is precisely to foster an environment that allows free markets to flourish. That means the rule of law, which means laws against fraud, laws to encourage transparency, laws that enforce contracts where you don't get the government doing what it did with General Motors and Chrysler and going in for political reasons and tearing up contracts to make a political payoff. That's what countries like Argentina have done and have turned themselves from once one of the richest nations in the world to one that is in perpetual trouble. Contracts, enforcement, we have laws to deal with problems that rise up. In terms of equality, absolutely essential to have equality before the law, because how else can a mere individual entrepreneur challenge the existing power structure if that individual is not protected by the law? Too many countries we see it, and we see it, people attempt to do it here, use the law to quash new entrants, to quash competition, to keep people at bay who might upset their own arrangements. Property rights, very basic. If you own something, it belongs to you. They said in England, man's home is his castle. Well, Kelo decision in the Supreme Court, as we know, four years ago, has been undermining that. We need to get back to basics of property rights. This is not protecting the rich. It's enabling people to get, accumulate capital, take the risks, and know that somebody's not arbitrarily going to come along and seize it from them. Essential for risk taking. So, rule of law, another one, which the Federal Reserve has completely forgotten in this country, sound money, stable value for a currency. If you don't have a stable value for a currency, it just makes capital less plentiful and more expensive, because it's risky enough to make an investment. But if you have to worry about the value of the currency itself, it just makes life infinitely more complicated and hurts us all. Think of it this way. What would your life be like if we floated the clock? <laughs> 60 minutes an hour, one day, 
80 minutes an hour the next, 30 in the day after, 10 the day after. Soon you'd have to have hedges, derivatives, futures to figure out how many hours you're working each week. Just make it simple. Keep, 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 keep it stable.